So did you know that copper is the only element that has eyes? Because it can see you. Have <laughs> you ever wondered what's the difference between Iron Man and Aluminium Man? Well, Iron Man catches all the bad guys, whereas Aluminium Man just foils their plans. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's Dr. Ryan here. I hope you and your family are well. I strongly encourage you to smash that subscribe, like and share buttons. We, today we're talking about two of our metallic brothers which have plagued the liver for many years. Hemochromatosis and Wilson disease. Thank you for joining me. Alrighty. So here's the outline of our talk. We're going to be covering a clinical case and then we're going to be looking at these two entities, hemochromatosis and Wilson disease, and tease them apart in terms of an introduction and then our seven cardinal headings, etiologies, patient presentation in terms of signs and symptoms, looking at a plausible differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation, uh, sleep and management modalities, prognostication, complication, and then we're going to end off encouraging from the scriptures. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Let's uh, get started. So we got a 55-year-old white male today with a history of diabetes. Presents to your office with complaints of generalized weakness, weight loss, non-specific diffuse abdominal pain, and erectile dysfunction. Oh, dear. The patient has a past history of hypercholesterolemia and takes a turvastatin. The examination is significant for uh, hepatomegaly without tenderness. Testicular atrophy and gynecomastia. Mm, smells like chronic liver disease. Skin examination has a diffuse slate gray hue. Slightly more pronounced on the face and neck. Joint examination shows mild swelling of the second and third metacarpophalangeal joints on the right hand. Which of the following studies is most likely to lead to the correct diagnosis? Is it A, anti-smooth muscle antibody, B, sideroplasmin level, C, hepatic ultrasound with Doppler imaging, is it D, a hepatitis B surface antibody, or is it E, your HFE gene mutation screen? Let's talk, guys. So hemochromatosis, as we know, is a genetic disorder of chronic iron overload. Mutations result in unregulated and excessive iron absorption from the gut. The most common autosomal recessive disease of whites with a 1 is to 10 carrier rate. Uh, severe sequelae of hemochromatosis like cirrhosis and congestive heart failure appear in middle-aged, uh, you know, among untreated patients. Cirrhosis eventually occurs among untreated patients, and once cirrhosis ensues, 10-year survival is just 60%, even with a liver transplant. Uh, Wilson disease is a genetic disorder of copper overload. Mutations result in a decreased biliary copper excretion. Without treatment, this disease is fatal by early adulthood. Okay, guys, let's look at uh, etiology, epidemiologies, and risk factors. So, in terms of hemochromatosis, we said it's an autosomal recessive disorder caused by defective genes that allow unregulated absorption of iron from the gut. Iron overload is the buzzword. Excess iron is continually deposited into various organs, especially the liver, the pancreas, the heart, the skin, the pituitary. The liver, the pancreas, the heart, the skin, the pituitary, free radicals are produced that interact with the DNA. Patients slowly accumulate iron from infancy but do not exhibit signs or symptoms of iron overload for many decades. Thus, patients are often diagnosed only after significant tissue injury has already occurred. Many patients are never diagnosed due to varying levels of penetrance and males accumulate iron quicker because females regularly lose iron during menses. Right? Wilson disease, also autosomal recessive disorder of copper metabolism this time. More than 60 mutations are known, which is whopping. Decreased biliary copper excretion results in copper accumulation in the liver, brain, cornea, bones, joints, other tissues. In the liver, the brain, the cornea, the bones, the joints, and other tissues. Typically presents in patients below the age of 40. Okay, here's a beautiful uh, table from Harrison's which shows us the classification of iron overload states. So it can be hereditary hemochromatosis, it can be acquired iron overload, it can be miscellaneous, right? So after hereditary hemochromatosis, there's HFE-related type 1, which shows C2A2Y homozygosity uh, and C2A2Y compound heterozygosity. 
Then we've got the non-HFE related, which we divide into juvenile hemochromatosis, type 2A, type 2B. Type 2A is associated with hemojuvenile mutation, hep 2B with hepcidin mutation. Then you've got the mutated transferrin receptor, type 3, and the mutated ferroportin 1 gene, type 4. Acquired iron overload can be due to iron-loading anemias or chronic liver disease. Iron-loading anemias, example, thalassemia major, sideroplastic anemia, chronic hemolytic anemia, transfusional and parental iron overload, and dietary iron overload. Whereas chronic liver disease, the culprits are hep C, alcoholic cirrhosis, especially advanced alcoholic cirrhosis, NASH, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, hepatitis, porphyria cutanea tarda, dysmetabolic iron overload syndrome, and post prostate cable shunting. Miscellaneous causes include iron overload in sub-Saharan Africa, neonatal iron overload, acetyloplasm anemia, congenital AIDS-Hans ferinemia. Okay. Okay, let's talk pathophysiology for a bit, guys. Oh, dear. Uh, I get my pointer in there. So here, we're looking at the pathway of normal iron uh, homeostasis. So diet C, inorganic iron, not organic, inorganic iron, traverses the brush border membrane of the duodenal enterocytes via the divalent metal iron transporter DNT1 after the reduction to the Ferric, from ferric to ferrous state by intestinal ferric reductases such as duodenal cytochrome B, right, which is what DCYTB. Iron then moves from the enterocyte to the circulation via process requiring the basolateral iron exporter ferroportin and the iron oxidase hephistin. In the circulation, iron binds to plasma transferrin and is thereby distributed to sites of iron utilization and storage. Now, much of the diaphoretic transferrin supplies iron to mature erythrocyte cells in the bone marrow for hemoglobin synthesis. At the end of their life, senescent red blood cells are phagocytosed by macrophages and the iron is returned to circulation after export through ferroportin. The liver-derived peptide hepcidin represses basolateral iron transport in the gut, as well as iron released from macrophages and other cells, and serves as a central regulator of body iron traffic. At least two separate signals regulate hepcidin production in response to changes in body iron requirements. The first involves the detection of the circulating diaphoretic transferrin by HFE and TFR2. A second relies on hepatic iron stores activating the hemojuvenin dependent bone morphogenetic protein BMP SMAD pathway. This pathway is modified by erythroferone released from erythroid precursor cells which binds to BMP. P6 and inhibits its function. TMPRSS6 is a protease that regulates hepcidin production, possibly by modulating hemojuvenin activity. Heme is metabolized by heme oxygenase within the enterocytes, and the released iron then follows the same pathway. Mutations in the genes encoding HFE, TFR2, hemojuvenin, hepcidin all lead to decreased hepcidin release and increased iron absorption, resulting in hemochromatosis, right? So this is showing us how everything works together, right? Hepcidin blocks ferroportin, uh, and ferroportin, the claim to fame of important is that it absorbs iron across the intestinal enterocyte in the ferrous form. Alrighty, thank you so much guys. So how do patients present with hemochromatosis? Well, hepatic iron overload leads to chronic hepatitis, hepatomegaly and possible cirrhosis. Pancreatic iron overload leads to diabetes, what we call um, bronze diabetes, right? Iron overload in the heart leads to congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmias if it plugs the conduction system. Iron deposition in the pituitary gland leads to decreased tropic hormones, resulting in adrenal insufficiency and hypogonadism. Arthritis as well because of calcium pyrophosphate in the joints, typically the second and third metacarpal phalangeal joints, already giving rise to so-called hook-like osteophytes. Here we're looking at the sequence of events in genetic hemochromatosis and the correlation with the serum ferritin concentrations, okay? Increased iron absorption is present throughout life. Overt symptomatic disease usually develops between the ages of 40 and 60, and can be, but can be detected long before this, right? So as we see, progressive increase in your uh, uh, serum ferritin concentration as you progress. But early on, we just have increased iron absorption, increased hepatic iron, increased serum iron, increased total body iron. But usually between the ages of 40 and 60 is where these become clinically manifested. Alrighty. In terms of Wilson disease, patients may be asymptomatic, but may develop chronic or fulminating hepatitis, which will proceed to cirrhosis if not diagnosed and treated early. Uh, copper deposition in the basal ganglia can give rise to Parkinsonism. 
can also give rise to psychosis uh, or deposition in the cornea, which gives us the pathognomonic Kaiser fleischer rings under slit lab examination, right? Looking at now the main diagnostic features of Wilson's disease, and we stratify these into a couple of headings, clinical signs and symptoms, biochemical lab findings, and molecular findings. So clinical signs and symptoms, hepatic would be jaundice, anorexia, vomiting, ascites, and edema, splenomegaly. Neurological with a deposit in the brain, especially the basal nuclei, can give reaction to dysarthria, facial grimace, which is called rhesus sardonicus. We saw this before when we spoke about tetanus, right? Drooling, dysphagia, dysgraphia, dystonia, tremor, Right, ataxia and seizures. Ocular manifestations is the infamous pathognomonic Kaiser Fleischer rings under slit lamp exam and so called sunflower cataract, which is somewhat rare. Psychiatric, you can have decline in school, personality change, mood disorder, schizophrenia. Biochemical and lab findings, guys, you have a low serum copper, you have a low serum seroplasmin, but an increased urinary copper excretion. So that underpins really the biochemical diagnosis. Elevated liver enzymes, hypoalbuminemia on the back of chronic liver disease. Increased liver copper level, so that's also diagnostic when you do a liver biopsy. Fatty liver, cirrhotic liver, hemolytic anemia are very important, and renal Fanconi anemia. Molecular findings is variance in the beloved ATP7B gene on both chromosomes, and a variance and variety of other polymorphisms, right? There's more than 60 mutations known of Wilson's disease. Here's the infamous case of Fleischer ring in Wilson's disease, which represents basically copper deposition in decimate membrane of the cornea. Beautiful case of Fleischer. All right, what's the differential diagnosis, guys? For hemochromatosis, is uh, you can have secondary hemochromatosis because of hemolytic anemia, hemoglobinopathies, or blood transfusions, A transfer anemia, A seroplasmanemia, Wilson disease, and chronic liver disease. Differential for Wilson disease includes vinyl hepatitis, hemochromatosis, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis, primary bruderic cholangitis, or isolated seroplasma deficiency. Most of these can cause cirrhosis in their own right. Okay, so guys, diagnostic evaluation of hemochromatosis, you really want to do your iron studies. You're going to find an elevated transferrin saturation above 50% and an elevated serum ferritin at least above 300 microgram per liter, and these are seen in more than 95% of cases, right? So a high transferrin sats, high serum ferritin. Mutation analysis of the HFE gene may be helpful in diagnosis and screening of first-degree relatives. Liver biopsy showing iron deposition is diagnostic, but MRI is not always necessary, but will show you increased iron content in the liver. Iron studies and genetic screening should be done in all first degree relatives of affected persons, right? Here's a beautiful diagram showing us the algorithm for screening of HFE-associated hemochromatosis, alrighty? So if you have someone who suspect has hemochromatosis in that it's an adult first degree relative of a patient with hereditary hemochromatosis or HFE associated hemochromatosis or a person with suggestive symptoms or a person with unexplained liver disease, you do your transferrin sats in your serum ferritin. And if your transferrin sats is below 45% in your serum ferritin, below 300, ah, it's probably not hemochromatosis. So just reassure and carry on. But if your transferrin sats is above 45% or your serum ferritin is above 300 microgram per liter, then you want to do HFE genotyping. If that is normal, you counsel and consider non-HFE hemochromatosis. But indeed, if that is that genotype is present, then you do the determine whether it's a C2A2Y homozygote or whether it's C2A2Y heterozygote, right? So if then basically it depends on the serum ferritin level. If the serum ferritin is between 300 to 1,000 microgram per liter, LFT is normal, just do phlebotomy, right? If the serum ferritin is above 1,000 microgram per liter and or the LFT is abnormal, proceed to a liver biopsy. But if your serum ferritin is below 300, microgram per liter, LFT is normal, just observe and retest in two years. So on the liver biopsy, if you've got iron overload, you go to phlebotomy, which is the definitive treatment. You can also use an iron chelator, like desferioxamine. But if the liver biopsy shows no iron overload, investigate and treat as appropriate. Already. Um, Okay, what about Wilson's disease, guys? How do we work up Wilson's? Well, diagnosis is made by a combination of clinical and biochemical findings. So typically, we said that your serum cytoplasm is low. You do a slit lamp exam for the presence of your beloved case of Fleischer rings in the cornea, which is very sensitive for the diagnosis if you also have concomitant neurology. An elevated hepatic copper level on liver biopsy, right? Liver biopsy is diagnostic, but not necessary. If you see the beautiful case of Fleischer rings, the patient has neurological sequelae, the patient has hemolysis with cirrhosis, you could probably bet your bottom dollar this patient has Wilson's disease without having to do a liver biopsy. Other lab problems include an elevated serum copper, elevated urinary copper, elevated transaminases, a low alkphos, and the presence of hemolytic anemia. 
Okay, guys, let's talk about management for hemochromatosis. Phlebotomy is the name of the game, right? So begin weekly phlebotomies until your ferritin falls below 20 microgram per liter. Thereafter, less frequent phlebotomies must be continued for life to keep your ferritin ideally below 50 microgram per liter. Then we talk about the iron chelator. Our good friend desferioxamine can be used if the patient does not tolerate phlebotomy. Treat associated diseases like diabetes and cardiac disturbance as necessary. Because we said we can have a dilated cardiomyopathy, you can have conduction disturbance with arrhythmias and heart failure and so forth. Liver transplant may be indicated if cirrhosis occurs, right? And then for Wilson disease, our management basically is to administer your copper chelator, which is D-penicillinamine, and increase your urine copper excretion in that way. It may cause vitamin B6 deficiency, which is associated with peripheral neuropathy, so watch out. Supplementation of B6 is necessary to give you a pyridoxine, right? Substitute dimacaprol if the patient cannot tolerate deep penicillinamine or if neurological symptoms predominate, all right? Strict compliance with pharmacotherapy is essential. You want to monitor pill counts and urinary copper excretion. Zinc supplementation may be used to decrease copper absorption from the gut. Decrease your intake of high copper foods, example chocolate, shellfish, and liver. Liver transplant may be indicated for patients who are formulating hepatitis or cirrhosis. Guys, prognosis complications, all patients should be immunized against hepatitis A and B. In hemochromatosis, any underlying liver disease, be it viral or alcoholic hepatitis or NASH or NAFLD, whatever it is, will expedite the progression of cirrhosis. Affected patients have an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, as do most patients with cirrhosis. Many patients die of heart-related disease in the way of arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death. Phlebotomy does very little to reverse the iron overload of heart muscle. Important point to note, phlebotomy does very little to reverse the iron overload of heart muscle, right? In terms of Wilson's, without treatment, Wilson's disease is fatal in early adulthood. Lifelong therapy with your copper chelator is necessary to avoid rapid hepatic failure and further neuropathology. Guys, coming back to our clinical case, right? So this was a case of hemochromatosis. We had a Caucasian gentleman coming in, 55 years old. He's got weakness, he's got weight loss, he's got abdominal pain, erectile dysfunction. He's got a hypercholesterolemia with the tofostatin. He's got hepatomegaly clinically with testicular atrophy and gynecomastia. So he's got cirrhosis clinically. Skin examination has diffuse steak gray hue. Joint exam shows second and third metacarpal phalangeal joints have arthritis. Which of the following studies is most likely to lead to the correct diagnosis? The answer is your HFE gene mutation. Thank you so much. Alrighty, guys. So let's allow me to encourage you from Scripture today. In the book of Hebrews, right? Chapter 9, verse 27 through 28. Now, we don't know who the author of the book of Hebrews is, but we do know that this book is in the New Testament and is inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Indeed, beloved, Jesus Christ is coming back. Is coming back to take those who are faithful and committed back with him to heaven, right? And even as the author of Hebrews tells us, it is destined, it is inevitable that we will die once and thereafter we need to face judgment. So all of us will see Jesus, but I pray that we will be faithful and committed so that Jesus can take us unto himself, so that we can form part of his church and so that we will inherit eternity in heaven with him. God bless you. Here are my references. If you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel and to like and to share this video. Thank you so much. You can catch me on Facebook. Just search for Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. I'm also on TikTok and Instagram as well. We're going to be covering some exciting topics coming up. We've got celiac disease on the way and nephrotic syndrome. Looking forward to seeing you then. Have yourself a lovely day. Mm -hmm.